Welcome to the Debate Drills Academy. My name is Rafi Piliero, and I'm here with Jack Johnson, and we are going to be analyzing the TOC semis debate from 2020 between Blake and Hawken. Jack, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. Thanks, everyone, for stopping by. All right. So, any preliminary thoughts about this debate? It is one of your debates, so I'm sure you do have some thoughts. Uh, anything you want to share about this? I'm not familiar with it. Um, I mean, it was a pretty darn good round. I remember enjoying this round a lot. Um, close round, good team, excited to get into it. Awesome. Cool. Let's get it started then. All right. One last time. Everyone's all good. No one's not ready. Cool. Grant and Inegate. Contention one is ending ISIS once and for all. Magid, two weeks ago, a foreign policy writes that with coronavirus causing chaos in Iraq, the Islamic State, which has once been on the back foot for years, is now eager to move into this power vacuum. Luckily, the United States helps to fight ISIS in two ways. First is by creating stability. Carafello 19 of the ISW explains that currently, areas ISIS has lost in Iraq and Syria are neither stable nor secure. Importantly, N17 of the CSIF finds that the only way ISIS emerged in the past was by capitalizing on the chaos in Syria and by the weak central authority on Iraq. However, U.S. presence fixes this problem, as COP18 of the Military Times explains that U.S. and coalition forces are involved in stabilization efforts, including resettling displaced Iraqi civilians and getting civilian infrastructure back by running again in cities that were devastated by ISIS. Branch 15 of the Strategic Studies Institute continues that because withdrawal prevents these efforts, removal of, Amer of American forces from a still unstable context could, previous, pre could, cut, uh, could undercut any previous counterterrorism gains and facilitate the instability in which jihadist organizations thrive. Second is by training Iraqi forces. NOAC of the Washington Post writes in January that American training and funding is responsible for the country's only counterterrorism force that is largely uncorrupt. However, if the United States withdraws a troop from Iraq, the governmental counterterrorism force would likely merge with Iranian-backed militias, which would undermine their reputation and constitute a large blow to the Iraqi state. Felcher 20 Politico corroborates that when the U.S. left Iraq in 2011, the Iraqi military quickly deteriorated to the point where the Islamic State could go in our absence. For these reasons, Karafala concludes that when ISIS seeks to reestablish territorial control in Iraq, it will likely succeed if the United States withdraws. The impact is refugees. Read 19 of World Vision writes that primarily because large-scale military conflict has died down, to date more than 4 million people have returned to their homes in Iraq uh, as a result of the ending hostilities. Unfortunately, they further that 1.6 million people still remain displaced and are in need of uh, humanitarian aid with poor living conditions. Contention 2 is stopping at another Middle Eastern war. Currently, Israel and Iran are sworn enemies, with Smith 19 of NBC News noting that Israel views Tehran as an existential threat. Luckily, U.S. presence in the region has thus far kept Israel at bay, but affirming reverses two warrants. First is nuclearization. At Zioni 19, professor at George Washington University writes that if Iran faces no reaction to its provocations, it will expand its nuclear program since Iran believes that nukes are the best guarantee for its national security and act as a proactive shield. This would be disastrous, as Farley 19 of the National Interest writes that if Iran appeared to be on the verge of nuclear weapons, Israel might well consider a preemptive nuclear attack, as Israeli planners would no longer deem a conventional strike sufficiently lethal to destroy or delay the program. Second is abandonment. Harold 19 of Peretz warns that Israel is scared by America's apparent desire to quit the region, which would leave Iran with more room to maneuver. Horowitz 19 for the Times of Israel corroborates that the concern in Israel is that America's hands-off approach will encourage the Iranians to act against the country. This is harmful, as Horshik 19 of the conversation writes, that Israel is known to take uh, aggressive and preventative action to protect itself, including by launching preemptive strikes on neighboring nations it views as threatening. If international relations with Iran grow more volatile, Israel could take dramatic unilateral action, which she concludes Iran would surely retaliate against and trigger a region-wide conflict that spirals throughout the entirety of the Middle East. This would be disastrous and lead to war, as Oren 19 of the Atlantic finds that the conflagration could be ignited by just a single spark. And after a, large, after a day of large-scale exchanges, the real war would begin with a number of rockets raining down in Israel, totaling 4,000 per day. Faced with thousands of casualties, Israel would surely deploy some of its nuclear arsenal to end the war quickly. Disastrously, Terse 13 of Mother Jones finds that such a strike would kill an estimated 5.6 million people and injure 1.6 1, injure 1. million more. To save lives, negate. All right, so... Um, you know, I think it's a pretty standard case for the topic. You've got a couple of different scenarios, a couple of different impacts, several unique links. I think it's a pretty average tech case for the topic. Um, one thing that sort of jumps out at me um, is the sort of like mutually exclusive scenarios that are existing under the second contention of nuclearization. It's sort of like Iran is going to like attack uh, if we don't 
mount a significant response against them. And then also Israel is going to attack. And, you know, obviously the two, um, I, I think it's kind of clear that only one of them can actually go first and start the war. Um, and so that's just sort of one inconsistency, inconsistency that catches my eye right off the bat. But other than that, I think it's a pretty standard uh, case for the topic. Yeah, I totally agree with you about that second contention. The other thing I would also say is that it seems like defense such as they won't nuclearize or they won't be able to, like the U.S. won't let them or they'll re-enter, you know, the Iran deal. Defense like that seems like it does totally just zap that entire contention, both of those scenarios. Mm -hmm. So it seems like it is susceptible to some defensive arguments that call into question how likely it is that they will nuclearize. So that's maybe yeah. one thing about, you know, perhaps not having a diversified set of internal links on that contention. Yeah, that's definitely true. Um, I think, honestly, the case is pretty darn stock. Like, it's open to the, just all of the classic, like, you know, U.S. counterterror bad turns on the first contention, and then a whole bunch of denuclearization defense um, on the second contention. So, yeah, pretty stock coming out of the gate. And when you see a stock case like this, when you're, you know, thinking of your attack strategy, what are you thinking? The biggest thing I'm thinking is, how can I identify the most damaging and far-reaching assumptions in this case, and then maximize my ability to leverage those assumptions. So for example, let's say that when we're looking at the first contention, the biggest assumption, just the, the biggest high-level assumption is that US counterterror is helpful, right? That would encompass both links and the impact. So naturally, if you can dump a bunch of turns on why that's not the case, then they will be forced to respond to those regardless of which individual link they go for, right? Um, I think where teams run into problems is when they get too bogged down in line by lining individual warrants and details. And of course, there is a place for that, right? You need to be engaging in line by line in evidence debate, yada, yada. But from a strategic point of view, in high level rounds, a lot of it comes down to the time split, right? When you have, say, two minutes to frontline, um, it's a lot harder to have to frontline 10 responses um, than having to frontline five responses. Because if you have to frontline 10 because the other team just dumped a bunch of turns that were applicable to your entire case and you can't kick out of them, that's a lot worse and a lot harder for you than if they just made a bunch of like uh, I independent link specific uh, defensive responses. And then, you know, you had three links, so you kicked out of two of them and then you know, most of their responses went away. So that's the biggest thing I'm thinking, right? I'm thinking, how can I um, maximize my uh, prep on these arguments, which should be very good because I've heard them, you know, 10 times or whatever. All right. Let's listen to the pro case. Let's use. Okay. Is everyone ready? Um, if I doubt it's going to happen, if my tech shorts out, just unmute yourself uh, and just clear me. Um, I'll slow down. I'm not going to spread or anything. Don't worry about it. I just don't know what the tech is going to be like. So it will be, it, it'll be good. Just clear me if you can't hear me. Is everyone ready? Contention one is Yemen. Has been 19 explains that benefiting from the U.S. security umbrella anchored by its base around the Gulf, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE have attempted to organize the region through military interventions. They launched with U.S. support an ineffective war against the Houthi rebels in Yemen. After America withdraws troops from the Gulf, Saudi Arabia no longer has a security umbrella that, it, that enables its adventurism into Yemen, which will cause them to turn to a negotiated solution to the conflict. As current conditions are ripe for an agreement, Hanley of March 2020 explains that the war has been costly in both financial terms and in the international reputation of Saudi Arabia. The Saudis have agreed to having the Houthi share in power with the Saudi supported Houthi government. This is true empirically. March of 2020. Recognizing that the U.S. military was no longer at their disposal, Saudi Arabia began exercising their diplomatic options. They stepped up direct talks with Houthi rebels. The, le the level of violence declined as a result with an 80% reduction in Saudi-led airstrikes. A power sharing agreement is critical. We've been 18. The fighting in the blockade in particular has disrupted uh, uh, imports of food, bullet, fuel, and medical supplies. Indeed, Landry in 2020 continues that the U.N. has described Yemen as the world's worst humanitarian emergency with 10 million people on the brink of famine. Attention to his drones. First in 2011 explains the Al-Udaid Air Base in Qatar is critical to drone wars in both Afghanistan and Pakistan. U.S. drones draw the U.S. into a conflict with Afghanistan for two reasons. First is direct escalation. Drones risk escalation crises from miscalculation and entanglement, which triggers war in Afghanistan. Shouts 2018. 
Low cost and ease of use suggests prolif of, of, of UAS drone capabilities will continue. The gap between signal interpretation and the interpretation of that signal leaves room for consequences. Two is anger and foreign powers. Drone strikes with strong and other powers cause war in Afghanistan as well as to China and Russia. Corona 13. The problem is that uh, the problem is the guidelines for how Washington uh, Washington uses drones have fallen well behind uh, the U.S. risk encouraging China, uh, China, Iran, and Russia to label their own enemies as terrorists and go after them across borders. If that happens, counterterrorism by drone strikes ends up le uh, leading the global le uh, leading to globally destabilizing interstate wars. The impact is direct conflict. The U.S. is on the verge of being pulled into Afghanistan right now. Davis 20. We must quickly withdraw our troops before the Kabul completely breaks down and troops get caught in a civil war. Tal the Taliban does not recognize the Afghan government as having authority with chaos now. There's no chance the Taliban will negotiate. Trump will nuke Afghanistan. Tourist 2020. Trump plans. Uh, Trump's plans include numbers of uh, numbers of dead, which means 20 million more, uh, or more Afghanistan's all uh, Afghans, all of them civilians. Trump does have the authority to launch weapons from his nuclear arsenal. Such will constitute a genocide. Afghanistan will be wiped off the face of the earth, as the president remarked. The death toll will exceed the Holocaust, the Rwanda genocide, and the Vietnam War and the Korean War all combined. Contention three is the U.S. Iran war. Aggressive foreign policy has put America and Iran in a collision course. Coronavirus is making the war in the Middle East even more likely. Germanos from April. Donald Trump threatened to attack Iran and make the country pay a heavy price. The global pandemic and economic collapse. Trump wants to add a major war into the mix. K in 2020 continues. Some of the administration seeks to use the COVID-19 crisis to capitalize on Iran's increased vulnerability. Withdrawing troops from Iran's backyard reduces the probability of U.S.-Iran war for two reasons. First is provoking Iran. Continued military presence risks miscalculation and provocation of Iran. Abido 20. U.S. fears of an imminent large-scale attack on its soldiers in Iraq is, in is entirely valid. Iran seems to be uh, Iran seems ready to do whatever it takes to drive American troops out of the country immediately. The escalation by U.S. troops in the Iran-backed militias is putting Iraq at, at all risk at, at risk of an all-out military conflict. This trims down the possible scenarios for the U.S. future in Iraq to only two: all-out war or departure sooner rather than later. Absent U.S. threat of invasion, Iran will cease its escalatory actions. Trevino 13. While Iran is supported as exporting Islamic revolution, these actions do not create a network for offensive capabilities to become a hegemon. Instead. The focus of the new regime is on survival, not expansion. Uh, second is a shift to diplomacy. America's approach to Iran has been overwhelmingly informed by aggression. Jones 11 confirmed the challenge has for too long been treated almost entirely through the lens of security and militarism. Withdrawing troops sends a signal the U.S. will shift to diplomacy, breaking the cycle of escalation. Hard 19. Peaceful coexistence requires the will to talk and compromise. If either party shows reluctance, the region will continue to live with the possibility of a war that could make all past wars look minor in comparison. A U.S.-Iran war would be devastating. It would cause, according to Chusovsky in 2018, a nuclear holocaust over a large part of the Middle East and Central Asia involving millions of civilian casualties. Even if nuclear weapons are not used, the bombing of Iran's nuclear facilities using conventional weapons would contrib contribute to unleashing a disaster with extensive radioactive fallout. I think one thing I like about it is that it seems like there is a lot of direct clash about some of this U.S.-Iran business. Like, it seems like the Khan is directly saying that, look, we need an aggressive foreign policy, otherwise they're going to nuclearize and Israel's going to zap them. And the pro is saying, no, it's, they're responding to the U.S. threat. It really just seems like a direct debate about retrenchment. Is it good or is it bad? And I'm not even sure if the impacts are all that separate. It really is just who controls the internal link to conflict with Iran. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a pretty accurate assessment of uh, where it's at at this point. I think that that's one thing that debaters need to be able to uh, sort of pick up on quicker, is that when the AF and the NEG coincidentally take a position that is the same, which generally speaking they're unconnected, but when they happen to take a position that is the same, it immediately becomes a linked debate. Um, and that's something that I think we navigate decently well throughout this debate, um, but that was something that even we could have done better um, overall um, in a lot of rounds. But yeah, that'll that'll play out um, increasingly as the round goes on. And a couple other things about this contention. I think our second contention about drones, as I listen back to it, is really confusing. Um, <laughs> this was uh, our, our strategy in uh, ELIMS of the TOC was I think we would have like, I think we had, you know, our case that we used for the duration of April. And I think we had gone to like two or three tournaments on April. And so we had sort of like three other flex contentions in the back pocket uh, that we would sort of swap in for the C2 because the ones we really liked were Yemen and Iran. Um, and drones was one of the flex contentions and it was really confusing. Um, but uh, the reason we liked it and the goal with the C2 was to provide a squirrely argument that confused teams a little and also most importantly, A, they couldn't turn um, and B, sucked up a lot of their time so that it was harder for them to deal with our other arguments. So that was sort of the thinking behind the, the drones argument. And then, of course, the Yemen contention was just sort of like our rehashing of our back files and knowledge from the Saudi arms sales topic from the year before. So, yeah. Yep, yeah, that all makes sense. Let's keep going.
Okay. Everyone good? Cool. Uh, on your parsley evidence, you say that without the United States presence, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia has set up talks, right? Uh, yeah, it was the threat of uh, U.S. withdrawal. Yeah. Uh, was it the threat of the U.S. withdrawal or was it Saudi Arabia feeling insecure about U.S. security commitments? That's the same thing. No, it's not. No, it's not. So, for example, Saudi Arabia could feel like the U.S. isn't going to protect it if they were attacked, but also have troops within the country, right? Um, the Parsi evidence is about a withdrawal of troops. It's about them being scared that the U.S. was going to withdraw troops. So let's talk about the timeline then. Why are they scared um, about withdrawing troops if the U.S. didn't talk about that until much later? You just asked a question I'm going to ask right now. Sure. So on your ISIS contention, your first link, your CFAF evidence says that um, ISIS expands by capitalizing on the chaos in Syria, for example, and um, on like 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 weak governments in like Iraq. So does that mean that um, con like conflict or like instability in the region controls the internal link into ISIS? Yeah, but it's also the other way around. So for example, what terrorist groups do is they instabil or they destabilize government. That way they can help with recruitment efforts and uh, from their like proxy war start and things like that. You don't read evidence in your case that says that, that happens. That's yeah, I know. I'm just, uh, just a hunch. Well, can I get a question? <laughs> can I get a question? Sure. Uh, on your case, you give me evidence from... Um, uh, Ab Abalco or something that says that Iran wants to drive out U.S. troops, right? Abado, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, would you say that that's their, like, like, how important is that to them? Um, the Abado evidence indicates that the United States presence in Iraq uh, poses an existential threat to, to uh, Iran. It says that they will do anything. So, like, how important is an existential threat, though, realistically? Um, uh, well, first of all, like any, like we, you also qualified something as an existential threat. To yeah, no, no, I know. I'm just like clarifying how important is that card? The quote, uh, the quote from the card says that the Iran will do anything that it can to expel U.S. troops from Iraq. Okay, cool. So we can see that. You get a question. Your, let's talk about your second contention, uh, your your Iran nuclearization argument. So, um, how does Iran have the money to expand their nuclear program? How do they have the money to? Yeah. Um. I don't know what you mean. They still sell some oil, like oil revenues down by half, but that doesn't mean it's zero. Right. So, so given the fact that uh, the United States sanctions are crippling Iran's economy, and the fact that coronavirus is also like a like a one two punch, also crippling Iran's economy by like twenty five percent, how does it, like where does Iran get the money to fund their nuclear program? Like how do In they the squo? They don't. We'll concede Iran's not nuclearizing. Can we get a question? Mm, wait, 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 wait. I mean, like post your your question. What? I mean, post AF, right? Like, if, if Iran doesn't have the money, they don't have the money to do it either way, right? Um, we so, disagree. So the the Corona stuff is yeah. probably damning in the short term, but realistically, like, uh, their economy is not going to tank like sure. permanently as a result. Well, one, we would disagree with that, but second of all, that's like that doesn't take into account the sanctions, right? My, my no, 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 but 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 sanctions are only crippling their economy by like half of oil revenue, which isn't everything. Uh, well, if that's true, then why haven't it like like Clearly, we're, we're 10 seconds over. Oh, are we? Okay, so. So I'm interested in what you think in particular about that Iran nuclearization exchange. It seems like one of those things that perceptually, you know, helps one side where the other side was just like, I'm not really sure how they fund it. But I'm not sure if it moves the needle because it strikes me as perhaps that takes out offense on both sides, right? If the, both contentions are about if Iran nuclearizes, there might be aggression or Iran's aggressive in response to the U.S., Iran not nuclearizing seems like it might cut against both contentions and not really help either team. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I agree. Um, I don't think this was a particularly strategic crossfire by either side. I think it was, you know, I, I, I thought it was like a decent cross. I thought it was respectful, informative, uh, but certainly, you know, nothing earth shaking occurred in this crossfire in my, in, in my mind. <laughs> yeah, for sure. What other thoughts do you have on it? Honestly, not too much, other than I think that it was interesting uh, for uh, it, that, that, that the first speaker on their side was sort of like willing to say, oh, okay, we'll concede that without sort of like implicating why it's fine that you are able to concede that without actually taking out your argument, which I is which is something that I personally would always do. Like if if I would say, oh, we'll concede that, I would more like to phrase it as, yeah, we agree with that. That's good for our argument too, right? Because it's all about sort of scoring psychological points and making sure that you're not sort of making it seem like you're actually backing off of an argument, more highlighting the areas of agreement that also help you, um, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. I agree with that. Let's see how the rest of the round proceeds.
Start on their first contention on Yemen. Three responses. First, the economists yesterday find that Saudi Arabia is already looking to withdraw from Yemen. That's really important because that means their entire contention is non-unique. Importantly, it finds that right now Saudi Arabia is uniquely losing the war, which is why they're trying to use coronavirus as a fig leaf to get out of the war. That's really important. There's no reason to vote for them. The Yemen war is ending anyway. Secondly, we would say they never explained to you why like U.S. support for things like arms sales and logistical support doesn't actually continue triggering like Saudi ar aggression and allowing them to keep fighting in Yemen. We would say it does. Lastly, Mara of the Guardian finds that the, Uni that the United Kingdom feels like very, very similar roles to what the United States does in terms of helping Saudi Arabia fight in Yemen. The reason that's important is because we would say that one, if what they're doing, or one, the, like, the evidence is pretty explicit on like what they're doing now is probably good enough to keep, going, keep continuing the war. But two, if it isn't, we would just say when the U.S. pulls out, like the U.K. fills in and does more support. Lastly, on their Parsi evidence where they say like that their argument is empirically true, that's just not true because during the same time that Parsi uh, talks about, the United States increased troops in the region. Go to their second contention about drones. Mainly, the only thing that matters is when they talk about like Qatar being crucial, like this Qatar base being crucial to Afghanistan, it literally makes no sense. The United States has four bases in Afghanistan anyway that are exclusive for drones. The reason that's important is because we'll just say we'll just use these bases instead of the one in Qatar. They never even explain why the one in Qatar is important. Second, EW finds that Reaper drones, which are like the ones we use, have one have a 1,000 mile distance. The reason that's important is because it means that literally the re like Qatar uh, being important makes no sense because one, we can use Afghanistan, but two, we can use other bases like Turkey, like bases in Turkey. We have drone, drone bases everywhere. Everywhere. Lastly, the Wash the Wall Street Journal seven, uh, seventeen finds that the CIA does a touch does it like, has a ton of drone bases the reason that's important is because the cia isn't the military so we'll just turn to cia drone strikes instead of military drone strikes this means you actually turn it because the wall street journal continues that the cia has no oversight which means that there'll probably be more civilian casualties when you vote for them on their like link scenario this literally makes no sense we've been doing drone strikes like since the obama administration if any of their argument was true like we'd probably be in war right now go to their third contention where they talk about u.s iran war first on like the uniqueness on their first warrant that like we're provoking them now that's not true cooper 20 finds that there's that right now the trump administration has no appetite for war but second even if we do, it doesn't matter because we only retaliate against Iran. We don't actually retaliate against Iran specifically because we can never prove that like the attacks done by Iranian militias come from Iran. But third, even when we do retaliate, it's not actually lethal, so it probably doesn't cause escalation because like the, the one example of retaliation was uh, against like Iranian militias. We just took out five militias depots at night to avoid civilian casualties. But lastly, even if we do attack them and like there's a lethal strike, it doesn't start a war because hard twenty finds that it's possible to use lethal force to actually lower tensions. The reason is because it. It creates red line violations that shows the other person where not to cross, concluding that you can lower tensions with lethal strikes. On their second contention, where they talk about diplomacy, the most important thing is that U.S. Iranian or second not second contention, um, second warrant, where they talk about diplomacy. The most important thing is that this type of diplomacy is never going to happen. The reason because Mackenzie 19 of CNN and finds that fundamentally the, that Iran will only negotiate if they remove sanctions, but offers go 19 of political finds that Trump's already taken that off the table. At that point, our world's better. The reason is because when you vote for them, Iran will expand into Iraq. Detmer 20 VOA explains that Iran views control over the Iraq is critical to their survival as Iraq serves an economic lung that can alleviate the impact of sanctions and a crucial logistical supply link that links Iran to the Assad region and Hezbollah. For this reason. Iraq will, Iran will never give up on fighting for Iraq. Voting pro ensures Iran controls Iraq. Middle of 19th, the military times explains the U.S. must maintain military presence in Iraq in order to counter Iranian influence. Importantly, for this reason, Jihad 24 on the rocks explains that a U.S. withdrawal would allow Iran to gain increasingly vast am amounts of influence in Iraq. This would be bad for re two reasons. First, Jihad continues that increased Iran Iranian influence would lead American hawks to treat Iraq as an enemy and push Trump to sanction Iraq. This would be devastating. Court writer one of the nation finds that sanctions on Iraq in the 90s resulted in the deaths of nearly 227,000 children. Second, Carnival 20 of the Miami, Miami Herald writes that the so called Shiite crescent stretching from Iran through Iraq to the Levant would be brought closer to reality. If Iran could maintain a foothold in Iraq, the establishment of the Shia crescent would be devastating for regional stability. Weher of Oxford, Wehu 17 of Oxford University writes that it would challenge the status quo of pro-Western Sunni dominance in the Middle East and could have a cascading effect into the region. Shia Sunni tensions could re-emerge, which would repel the possibility of a Shia Sunni conflict even more. This would be devastating as Kedar of INN writes, the ongoing political wars between Sunni and Shia still caused many thousands of deaths on the eight-year the eight -year war between Iraq and Iran resulted in well over a million. Secondly, or lastly, Shia, Shia crescent short circuits all of their offense because if there's like a war between Saudi Arabia and Iran because of it. It also brings in the United States because, like, we back them. Um. So I think that there are parts of the speech that are good, and then other parts that aren't so good. So I think the part that is the high point in my mind, um, is I think his coverage of our C two is really good. Like, honestly, he kind of wrecked our C two with his responses, which it, honestly, I I don't think it was that solid of an argument to begin with. But I think that he accurately points points out the biggest flaws, which are that like. We already have bases in Afghanistan itself, which like isn't really topical. Um, and then we also um, uh, like don't even need this base either way for that war. So I, th I think he deals with this pretty well. I think the downside of the speech is that the coverage, just like raw number and type and quality of responses on the first and third contentions, I don't really think is like exactly overwhelming. 
um there's not like a like like there's there's not a whole lot of responses and they're also mostly defensive and they're pretty easy to kick out of and front line i think the reason he does this is to leave himself time for the essentially like new contention that he reads towards the end of the rebuttal um that is just this new war scenario about like shia crescent um so uh you know which which is good for him because it gives him a whole nother advantage but you know we were ready for this argument and all that so that's pretty much how i evaluate his speech i agree i think the other thing missing is just impact calculus i know you and i have talked a lot True. about the importance of impact calculus in you know the second con speech or second pro speech when all the arguments are on the table that you do have the ability to compare and i think that's missing from the speech yeah i think that's especially significant given the fact that we do have a lot of overlap um, with our arguments. So I think some some link weighing, some uniqueness analysis, some evidence comparison would be a uh, significant benefit to the speech. Yeah, and even just impact comparison. That Like, you know, both mm. teams have arguments about Middle East war on this, like, Iran attacks or Israel attacks business. Why not just say ISIS outweighs? Or why not uh, just, like, try to find something that's external and just do that comparison so you access the highest layer? Right. That's fair. I My guess is the reason why they might not want to do that um, and why most teams don't do that in the first rebuttal um, is because if you have two contentions and you weigh one of them, there's a 50% chance that that weighing becomes useless after you kick that contention. With that being said, it still probably makes sense to do, especially in cases where your argument is directly responsive to the opponent's like actual scenario. I totally agree. Let's see what happens next. All right. Is everyone ready? Okay. Start on Yemen. The first thing he says is that, is that there is a ceasefire in the status quo. That's not true. Jazeera explains that the Houthis have violated the ceasefire 200 times. And what they and what they conclude is that the reason that the current ceasefire is failing is because the Saudi Arabians are not uh, exceeding to Houthi demands. We say that if Saudi Arabia has no uh, internal assurance for its own internal security, then they have to, to limit the extent to, to the, uh, the extent of their external military intervention. That's what they have to turn to diplomacy. Then they say that we don't solve arms sales. That is not about the internal stability of the kingdom. The arms sales cannot provide the bases and such that prevent an invasion and make it impossible. Then they say that other actors will keep fighting. But Andrew explains that the uh, that the power sharing scenario necessarily sucks in all other actors that are relevant in the region. Iran, Houthi rebels, which means that other actors are not relevant because they're subsumed by the diplomacy scenario. Then he says, then he answers Parsi by saying we pulled out troops. He does not cite a car for saying we pulled out troops. Therefore, as an assertion of fact, it does not exist in the round. Flow Parsi through. It is 100% uh, conceded insofar as he makes a factual assertion with no evidence that caused an 80% decrease in airstrikes as soon as the uh, presence was threatened. Then on the second contention of drones, we concede both pieces of defense. Uh, Reaper drones mean we continue as normal and we have bases in afghanistan that kept us out of the cia bases turn because we didn't need to turn of the cia bases in the first place then on iran his first response is that the u.s has no appetite for escalation he drops the k evans explaining that post coronavirus america has been escalating more because they see it as an opportunity he also posts their evidence it's from april then all three of his new warrants for no escalation none of them are actually directly responsive to our scenario abu from april um explains that in the status quo uh, iran and the u.s are escalating now because iran views that the u.s has to be pushed out of the region what's important is that they say that that america won't escalate it doesn't matter as far as Iran attacks us, we have no other choice whatsoever. The other reason why our evidence is better is because it postdates their evidence by two years. At that point, I prefer that evidence. Then they read these two turns um, on sanctions, um, or uh, th these two turns on the sanctions impact. First turn, if the U.S. only imposes sanctions if Iraq forces withdraw. Greenwald 2020 explains that amidst Soleimani's kill killing, the U.S. threatened to impose sanctions on Iraq, should his government uh, insist on a troop withdrawal. That means choosing to withdraw on our own terms prevent sanctions. Second turn, if the U.S. presence creates preconditions for sanctions. Uh, Fatabi 2020 explains the U.S. action only amplify voices in Iraqi politics who argue that Americans have to go now. Iran's Iraqi allies will consolidate their influence in the country's politics. Then on the Shia Crescent, two responses. First, Abu 2019 explains that it is not unique. Iran expanding into Iraq in the status quo. The evidence is specific and it postdates theirs. And again, it's from, uh, it's, it's from this April, literally two weeks ago. Secondly, they can see the Trevino 13 evidence indicating that Iran is defensive realist. That means if there is not an immediate threat on their doorstep, their foreign policy paradigm means they do not expand. That means the Shia Crescent never is formed. Go to their case. On the first contention of terror, affirming solves better for two reasons. A is anti-American sentiment. For all in Gautner 17 explained that the, vi that the visible and militarized presence of the United States has helped feed the growth of terrorism and anti-American sentiment throughout the Middle East, pulling U.S. troops out of the region, will reduce casualties. B is misuse of military equipment. Austin 18. An investigation has shown numerous examples of arms supplied by the U.S. ending up with the hands of militias, including Al-Qaeda and ISIS. But then, on the first link about uh, stability, turn the argument. Bossy 13 explains that drone strikes kill civilians. We've abandoned it. Uh, all all sums of accurate targeting. That's important because A, it supercharges the anti-American sentiment and causes more instability. And B, 
speed also causes more destruction of infrastructure. That's less odd. That's less stability. Then on training, Cordesman 2020 explains that the U.S. abandoned all training because they have viewed it as a failure. On the second contention of nuclearization, um, two general responses. First, we concede what they say in cross. The sanctions don't cripple uh, Iran's ability to nuclearize. However, CNN in 2020 explained that, that the United Nations released a, a report saying Iran has developed nuclear-capable ballistic missiles. Tehran's stockpile of low enriched uranium now far exceeds the limit set by the nuclear deal. Second, turn the argument. Affirming solves. Shapiro and Solsky 2016 explains that Iran's main uh, incentive to acquire nuclear weapons is to deter U.S. conventional attacks. The lower U.S. military presence in the region diminishes those fears. On the first link, first, they're warned that if there's no reaction to Iranian expansion, they'll nuclearize. But that assumes that sanctions, NATO presence, Qatari presence, all leaves. There's always that non unique incentive. But second, to turn it. Iran is more emboldened than their world. Jones 2011 explains that the presence of American military in the Gulf has emboldened them, surrounding Iran militarily, checking hardliners within Tehran, and convinced them the best path, uh, the best path to self preservation is through militarism. On the second link, first, delink them. Tizzle 2020 explains that if we remove troops, we'd reassure Israel with a mutual defense treaty. Israel supporters in Congress would ensure this happens. But then, Israel would never strike because the Chusanovsky evidence explains that if there is any nuclear strike in the Middle East, it causes massive fallout that affects Israel too, so they would never strike Iran with nuclear weapons. You know, I think it's pretty solid. I think that there are like some small front lines that I could have warranted a little bit well. Like, I think my front line to the Mira evidence from The Guardian could have been a little bit better. Um, I said that it subsumes Iran and the Houthi rebels, but I needed to say that it subsumed the UK, which is like kind of the point of the mirror evidence. So like, I think my response there was kind of meh. Um, but besides that, I think one of the biggest things that I did it like well in the speech is that I generated a bunch of new offense uh, to force their summary to deal with. So first of all, um, because I'm able to frontline the first contention and the third contention, we have um, either or both contentions that we can go for. And so the summary needs to deal with both of those. The summary also needs to deal with the offense that I generated in response to their like new contention thing that they read in the rebuttal. Um, and then I also straight turned their first contention. Um, I didn't say anything that like could allow them to kick out of my turns on terrorism. Um, so yeah, um, I think that the biggest goal of a high level second rebuttal should just be to make the first summary really hard and i think this speech does that pretty well yeah and jack that straight turn part is so important because if you did mm. jump a bunch of offense but let them kick out of stuff because you also read defense they can then make the debate smaller you want to keep the debate big to keep the summary spread out here and then right. you're the one who gets to make the debate smaller on your own terms so i think that was a smart strategy for sure yeah, that's that's super important. You always want to be controlling the the way that uh, the offense in the round evolves. And honestly, straight turning arguments is a strategy that is not hard at all, and it's so effective. And it's something that's very underutilized by teams in public forum right now. Yeah, I completely agree, and I think that it is something that you took advantage of here and did effectively. Um, cool. Let's keep going. Okay. Uh, you good for cross? Mm -hmm. All right. Cool. Uh, yeah, I guess I'll just take first question. Okay, so on our argument about sanctions, you read two turns. The first is that, like, we'll get kicked out, right? Uh, yeah. That Trump will impose that. What was the second one? Uh, the second one is that U.S. presence in the region causes a... Uh, a surge in anti-American sentiment among Iran, which strengthens the influence of, or no, w within Iraq, and which strengthens the influence of uh, pro-Iran parties, and that's the root cause of why America would sanction Iraq. It's the influence of pro-Iran parties. Okay, sure. Do you have a question? Yeah. Um, so let's talk about your uh, your impact scenario. So let's just like enter into a hypothetical world in which my uniqueness evidence is correct. And um, Iran is, in fact, developing nuclear weapons. If that is the case, is there any explanation for why Israel has not preemptively struck? If Wait, if Iran has a nuke? Yes. Yeah, sure. I guess we'll concede our first warrant isn't true if your um, nuke evidence okay. is good. Well, also the second warrant. Why? The internal is the same. I mean, we no, it's totally different. Because we could just say that, like, U.S. security guarantee solves, right? Like... Yeah, but you don't have evidence that says that. Horowitz just says that hands-off cool. approach means that they respond to Iranian nuclearization differently. Your evidence I mean, doesn't so our, say that. Our, our second warrant That's just is basically that, is that... No, no, no. Our second warrant is that the United States is like a presence that stabilizes like Israel's fears. Can I get a question? No. Horowitz does not say that. Horowitz says that, a uh, like, in general, a hands-off approach causes Israel to have some fears, but the only evidence that makes the internal link no. to an Israel strike assumes that Iran does not yet have nuclear weapons, and if they developed them, then the strike occurs. I mean, yeah, we're so, just going like, to disagree. First link is the internal question. Link. Okay, sure. Okay. 
on your first contention about Yemen, you said that like, so you said something. I, my response was that the UK can like fill in for whatever the United States is doing, and you said that like other actors aren't relevant. Why isn't the UK relevant? Wait, hold on. Wait, sorry. Say that again. So I read the merit evidence, which says that like the UK provides like similar support that yeah, the yeah, United yeah. States does, and then you said something yeah, about like yeah, other yeah. actors not relevant. No, right, yeah, because that evidence is primarily talking about, like, arm sales and low-scale logistical support. What my response is that it's about, like, basically providing for the internal security of the Saudi regime, which looks like military bases that are ready to deter if an invasion happens tomorrow. Um, it looks like the uh, presence of, like, for example, a large, like, drone infrastructure to carry out attacks. The, okay. the security infrastructure is more than just some weapons and, like, maintenance. And stuff. Also, that's wait, all can, I get a quick, can I get a quick follow-up? Sure. Are analytics like fine? Uh, analytics debate? that make an assertion, no, hundred percent, they're fine. But analytics that make an assertion of fact without citing a card are not fine. You need a, a okay. card if you're going to say so something like, is factually correct. If Zayn goes up and reads a card that says troops went up after the Soleimani or after like the Aramco attack, which is what Parsi is talking about, is that like sufficient? No, that would, that would be totally unfair because then why don't I just make my whole rebuttal into a bunch of analytics and then whatever I want to extend, Morgan will read the actual card. It would save time. That's totally unfair. You can't do that. I think that's time. So what's what do you think in truth about this whole card analytic thing? I can see the merits of both sides. Like, of course, analytics are useful to point out logical gaps between stuff. If you're saying something that's just purely factual, like maybe you don't need a card. But a lot of the time, of course, you know, you're a high schooler. It is one of those things that doesn't have a lot of weight. And if you're making an empirical argument, you need a card. So I can sort of see the merits on both sides. But what do you think about this? That's fair. I mean, you know, honestly, you know, obviously I'm the most biased man on earth on this question, but I <laughs> really do agree with the perspective of myself in this round. So the standard in public forum, as it's as it's listed in the rule book, is that uh, common knowledge you don't need a you don't need a card for, right? So if we're just talking about like general stuff that's like in the news, it's like not that specific, then you know that's fine. You don't need a card for it. But what he said in the rebuttal is okay. The specific period of time that the Parsi evidence is talking about um, where Parsi the card makes the assertion that oh we withdrew troops in this like what, what was like October or something he makes the assertion that no actually in like October or November or whatever the month was in that specific period of time we actually increased our troop presence right and so I would say that that goes above and beyond the common knowledge threshold because, like, I really don't think it's common knowledge whether or not the U.S. increased its troop presence in, like, November of 2019 or whatever. And if you can make any assertion of fact uh, that is not common knowledge um, and you don't need a card for it, then you don't need evidence in debate. So, yeah, I'm definitely biased on my own side here. I'm totally with you, and I think I lean more towards your side as well, but I see the merits of both sides. What are your thoughts on the cross strategy itself, like for both sides? Yeah, um, I mean, I thought this cross went pretty well for us um, because I think that, you know, I like certainly like very competent debater on the other side. But I think that he asks like clarifying questions because he didn't like flow something or because he didn't fully understand something. And, you know, like that's fine if you need to ask those questions. But I'm of the opinion that. You should ask your partner those questions, right? Because whenever you let me just like re-explain my arguments in Crossfire, um, I'm going to do it in a way where I'm as charitable as possible to what I said. And then as I'm explaining them, I'm also in the back of my mind thinking about what I want to emphasize. So when he asked me the clarifying question of like one of those responses, I, I, I make the assertion that, oh, this solves the root cause of your argument, which is something I might not have, I, I might not have even said in rebuttal. So you just kind of allow your opponent to strengthen um, their own argument when you ask them questions like, you know, what did you say here? Um, and so I think that that helped us. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, you know, I think that what we, we gained a minor boost here. But, you know, again, nothing earth shattering really happened in, in, in the cross. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I think the other risk is just your opponent can ramble and waste your time. Uh, right. It's yeah. I think clarification questions are more for your partner. I agree. Okay. Right. Let, let's keep going. Okay. Everyone good. Um. Top down their stuff first. Sign post from there. Sorry, you said you're going on our stuff first. Yeah. 
Okay, no one is not ready? Cool. So on the first contention about Yemen, the economist evidence is severely mishandled, but it says that Saudi Arabia and the status quo wants to withdraw from the war because they think they view that they're losing it and they're using corona as a fig leaf. Their only response that the ceasefire is failing, that doesn't actually matter. Our evidence takes the ceasefire into account and still says that they want to dip from the region. Next on the parsi evidence, you can still carry through the index because the Hubbard evidence, which we don't read but we're reading now, says that the U.S. increased troops in October and, and November. Then you saw the increase in diplomacy. And so far as that's true, the link is reverse causal. Go to the second contention, it's conceded. This means that we kick out the turn on our case when they talk about drone strikes. Go to the third contention. Very briefly, start by extending a couple of the pieces of defense grant reads. The first thing we say is that none of the attacks that the United States are doing in the status quo are lethal. This means that the, at the very best, you can doubt their link on probability. Secondly, extend the Harvard evidence which said that even if we do use lethal force, this is actually a good thing because you can do things like create a red line and actually decrease tensions and decrease the probability of war. Once again, two conceded pieces of defense. The post date doesn't actually matter because these are very general responses. Next, they extend the tribunal evidence saying that right now uh, Iran is only like a defensive actor and attacks against the U.S. as a result. However, they've conceded the McKenzie evidence on their second word about diplomacy. What McKenzie finds is that Iran would only do things like negotiate and step down tensions if the United States withdraws sanctions. Unfortunately, he also concludes that sanctions are never going to get withdrawn on Iran, and therefore Iran will always be aggressive. Their link is triggered regardless. Go to the turn. The Denver evidence is conceded, which says that if our, uh, that Iran and the status quo needs Iraq for its economic survival, this means that it went. Uh, the, the middle evidence says that in the status quo, the United States is deterring Iran from be becoming increasingly aggressive, and Jihad says that when the United States withdraws its troops, therefore uh, Iran would gain more political control. Two implications: A, the United States war hawks would view Iran, uh, Iraq, the same way that they view Iraq, and uh, or view Iraq the same way that they view Iran, and therefore have uh, sanctions on them. 220,000 people. Uh, let's do a couple of front lines of that. The first response I give is that the United, uh, United, if they kick out the United States, like withdrawal is uh, really bad. Omar front lines this by telling you that Iraq would never actually kick them out because they fear sanctions in the first place. The second turn they give is about sentiment, but insofar as there's, there's no uh, anti-American protest in the status quo since February, that turn doesn't apply. Go to the second implication. The second implication is about the Sunni Shia Crescent. What it finds that right now in the status quo, Iran's trying to uh, become increasingly aggressive in Iraq in order to uh, expand the uh, Shia Crescent, which would lead to cascading Sunni Shia conflicts all the Sunni countries believe that they're being encroached upon by Iran. The historical precedent is that the eight years old war killed one million people, and the uh, prerequisite analysis is also conceived in, in Jack's rebuttal. What it says is that in the status quo, if the Sunni Shia crescent were to happen, you see cascading conflicts throughout the entirety of the Middle East, which definitely prerequisites their case because then Iran would get involved. They say two things in response. First, they say that Iran's is expanding in the status quo. That's not true. The middle evidence is conceived in rebuttal, which is that right now the United States is deterring. The second thing they say is a tribunal evidence um, saying that they're defensive. But again, Mackenzie frontlines this by telling you that uh, in this quo, like uh, Iran will always be aggressive if the U.S. is there and sanctions do that. Go to the second, the first contention doesn't matter, terror is low impact. Go to the second contention. Uh, we concede nuclearization, uh, sanctions definitely stop them from doing that. That kicks out of uh, Iran being aggressive because of the Jones evidence because they're always being approached upon. On the second word about abandonment, they give you the Tisdale response about the mutual defense treaty. This doesn't actually matter because the U.S. is never going to, uh, Iran, Israel's never going to sign over its military to the United States if they feel abandoned. So, uh, the second thing they say is that Israel, uh, uh, Israel won't nuke because they'll get attacked. We concede, therefore the Tisdale turn doesn't matter in the first place. Oh, uh, the reason that Israel feels abandoned because Horowitz finds the concern in Israel that America's hands-off approach in the Middle East is going to lead to Iran attacking Israel. This speech does some things really well, um, but also makes a couple of key mistakes. So starting off with some of the things I think the speech does really well, I think the speech does very uh, – I, I think the speech extends defense pretty darn effectively on our case. Um, I think that he does a good job of sort of like twisting my grouping – of arguments is like dropping them and and it's fair because there are some nuances that i don't explicitly engage with so i think that that's done quite effectively um a couple of areas where there's something left to be desired the first is that the straight turn uh on the c1 is not properly handled um he seemed to assume that he could kick out of them by like kicking uh, by by like conceding other defense the drone stuff but the turns weren't contingent on the drone stuff so i think that was a mistake um, the other thing is that I think that, uh, you know, given the fact that he doesn't like really extend his own C2 that much, it seems like they're trying to go for the Shia Crescent type stuff, like the, uh, rebuttal offense. But I don't think that there's enough of, I, I don't think that the frontlining work, um, to the April evidence about how Iran is expanding into Iraq and the status quo, um, and to the Trevino uh, thing about defensive realism, which had already been conceded. I don't think there's like enough work done there. The extent of the response to those is just sort of um, asserting the opposite, but there's not really language of preference in this last speech about why, like, when I say with Trevino that Iran will never expand because they're defensive realists, the only response is just like, no, our evidence says the opposite, right? Um, and so it's kind of being set up. Uh, as a wash 
um, in in my view, coming out after this speech. So, um, yeah, that's that's my take on the speech. I agree. Two things to add. I think the first is it feels like the speech maybe runs out of steam a little bit towards the end. I think it's really good on the defense, very efficient, gets through it, but I think then gets bogged down a little bit as it goes on and maybe doesn't cover as much. And I think in particular doesn't deal with the straight turn, which is my second comment. You just have to be so careful with straight turns that if they only read uniqueness answers and a link turn, you're kind of stuck with it. And it's hard to kick out of it unless there is defense that is directly applicable. And I'm not sure that the drone's defense does take out the straight turn. So I think that was the thing to be more cognizant of, I think, during that speech. Yeah, definitely. Totally agree with all that. Okay, let's keep going. It's going to start at the top. It's going to go top down the case, like, briefly, and then it's going to go on to the Iran scenario. Then when I'm on the Iran scenario, that's when I'm going to do all the turn answers or the answers to the turn. Does that make sense? Sorry, where are you starting? Uh, your case. First contention. Hawkins, Hawkins case, yeah. <clears throat> Is everyone ready? They can see the first terror turn was a terrible idea. The terror turn says that the, that, that anti, uh, that, that the United States presence in the region leads to anti-American sentiment, which is the, the, the main reason that ISIS is able to recruit members and ISIS is able to expand. Our evidence indicates that anti-American sentiment in the region is literally the single root cause of terror and outweighs any sort of United States presence, which is which is physically shutting them down, which is literally putting a band-aid on a bullet hole in case they tried to extend through ink to answer this, but they shouldn't because they literally dropped it. You can wait in two ways. First, strength of like this is 100% conceded. There's going to be, it's going to be really messy on the um, like turn that they go for. Or on our Iran case, like they already made it really messy. This is really a really clear possible. But second, is on a prerequisite. They tell you in Grand Crossfire that ISIS resurgence terrorism controls the internal link to stability in the region. So far as ISIS capitalizes and, and, and ISIS attacks, well, weaken the strength of governments, including the governments in Iraq and anyone else where the Shia crescent would be, and cause mass civilian deaths and conflicts. As far as terrorism is the root cause, or it's, it's the root cause and controls the internal link into destabilizing Iraq, that means at best for them in their turn scenario, the turn about the Shia crescent and conflict in Iraq is not unique because conflict breaks out because of terrorism. But uh, on their on the on the bottom, briefly, in case they go for Israel, uh, the TISL evidence says U.S. does the defense treaty. Their front line has no warrant, no card. The U.S. is not going to abandon Israel. Let's go to our case. Extend the Iran link. The uh, uh, Abido evidence is really clear. It says that there is a binary right now. Uh, uh, Iran will do everything they can to expel the United States troop presence from Iraq. It says that either you, the U.S. removes the troops right now, or there's literally a war that breaks out in Iraq that expands to a U.S.-Iran war. The two-stop evidence says that that uh, causes nuclear fallout and kills millions. Look at their responses first. They say that the, that, that, that the current strikes are not uh, lethal. One, uh, we post a, uh, like we, we post a them. These strikes now are lethal. But second of all, that was literally only one strike that's compared. If you look, um, if you look, um, like ballistically, uh, we actually prove it. Next, they say that the lethal force decreases tension in the United States. One, it's not going to decrease tension as far as Iran sees it as an existential threat. And clearly, Iran does not see lethal force as, uh, like as a deterrent because Iran is the one that's lashing out right now on the turn, um, on all of the turn stuff. Okay. First on the sanction thing, they really, really mishandled the anti-American sentiment argument. We tell you that anti-American sentiment uh, is never going to go away, or is never going to go away, or no, 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 anti-American sentiment actually goes away in our world, and that is the reason that um, there are, that, that there are hawks and that are going to be sanctioned. They respond by saying that there are no protests now. That was not a very good front line. A, there clearly are protests now, but B, there doesn't need to be protests so far as there are elections happening in the status quo. That means that we solve for the root cause of all of these issues with by, by getting rid of anti-American sentiment. Next on the idea about the Shia crescent, they really mishandled this. The Abido evidence is really, really clear. It's that Iran is expanding into Iraq literally in the status quo. They respond by saying that the U.S. is trying. We totally close state them. Also, our evidence is a, a proves uniqueness that is conceded that says that we are asking right now. Prefer the literally most recent evidence is from literally April. Next, the Trevino evidence is really important. It says that uh, Iran is a defensive realist, which means they're not going to expand. Um, oh, 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 also, also, on the negotiations argument saying that they're never going to negotiate because of sanctions, first of all, you can't be you can't be expansionist and still not negotiate. But second of all, our Trevino evidence says that they still won't expand even if they don't negotiate. You cannot negotiate and still not expand expand which is why they are not like uh mutually exclusive um at that point i'll uh i mean like war between the u.s and iran is like much bigger because the u.s has military capabilities and any sort of proxy war machine is going to be able to impact on their um in, uh, their uh, summary so I think there's the beginning of some good impact calc, although I think there could be more with some of this war between the U.S. and Iran is bigger argument, this like terror outweighs and strength of link. I think one thing that the speech could capitalize more on, though, beyond just more impact calc, is just dealing better with the idea that the straight turn was mishandled and flagging at the top, really. This was mishandled. And I think that type of judge instruction can just be useful in an otherwise slightly confusing debate. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Totally agree with all that. Um, there's certainly something to the strategy of just starting the speech whenever and with the clearest, cleanest path of the ballot. 
One thing that I think he does really well um, at the top of the speech is that he characterizes the flow, right? He talks about how, hey, like we all know the rest of this debate is like a bit confusing. It's a bit messy and true to form. It was pretty messy on the rest of the flow. Um, but yeah, starting with that um, straight turn was good. I also think, and this is one general PF concept um, in terms of strategy and probably a general debate concept as well. But you know, you're always adjudicating in terms of what to go for between resistance and relevance, right? You want to go for low resistance arguments and you want to have high relevance arguments that are important for the rest of the debate. And so after the summary, the straight turn becomes a very, very low resistance argument. It's essentially free offense for us. So then the question becomes, how do we make that into a high relevance argument? And I think that the two Wang arguments that he makes essentially do that. In terms of my criticisms for the speech, I think that the biggest problem on the rest of the flow is probably just under warranting. Um, first, I don't think like the like our extension is warranted that well. I also don't think he calls them out for like not warranting their extension. So overall, there's something left to be desired there. Um, additionally, I think that the warranting needed to be a bit better on the line by line on the Shia Crescent slash sanctions debate. Um, for example, I think there needed to be more explicit engagement with like McKenzie. I think that the whole like yes no yes no thing continues right where we're like Iran's a defensive realist and they're like no our evidence says the opposite and then we just get up in the speech and then we're just like no they're a defensive realist and so nobody really takes it deeper and comes up with a clear reason to prefer the evidence I think if anything we have the reason to prefer with the post state um, but on a, on like a logical level I think more work needs to be done so yeah that's my uh, two cents about the speech. Yeah, I agree with all that. Let's cool. see what happens next. Y'all ready for Graham? Morgan? Or actually, yeah, we're good. Y'all good? Right. Y'all gonna have the first question since you go first. Cool. Uh, okay. Let's talk about terrorism, Zanes. I guess. Mute your phone. Oh, Mute your phone. Bad. Is that better? Grant? Yeah. Resetting. Cool. Three minutes when y'all are ready. All right. Let's talk about terror. Is terrorism going up or is it going down in the status quo? You don't extend uniqueness through summary, so there is the no thing is, assessment neither... the judge can make of uniqueness. Our, our evidence, uh, first of all, says, it's scaler. That, says that A is scalar, B says Everything's that scalar. even if terrorism is down in the status quo, that doesn't mean that it's going to stay down. Third, we say that even if that's true, like we saw for terrorism long, long into the future because the U.S. Is, the U.S. and the American sentiment is the sure. Cause. So the anti. But so uh, anti I'd actually like to ask a question because uh, y'all. Well, so, you, I, I asked. You, you guys were talking for the last. You straight up conceded this in summary. How are you? How do you think? No, no, no. I said. I'm not. No, no, no. It's the same response. I'm saying the impact is small because the uniqueness is very tiny. So, for example. Uh, the impact what? card read, the impact card reads really really bad. The reason is because it says 1.6 million Iraqis are displaced currently, but last year two million got replaced. So, so for example, so two things. Like, two things. Sure. Can I wait, wait, Morgan? Hold on, Morgan. Hold on. So yeah. two things. Firstly, you don't give you a uh, bad uniqueness as the reason for the impact being small. There's no warrant for why the impact is small. Second, you don't have an indict your own evidence in summary, even if that wasn't sketchy. So functionally, all, you just give us the door wide and, open and, to just and, take your and, impact. And third of all, the, we don't. If the impact that we extend to terrorism is not the displacement card. We don't extend displacement. The impact that we extend is destabilizing the government in Iraq. Would sure, you sure, tell sure, sure. Happens. Would you tell yeah. me happens? I yeah, but how? Can, can like, you? Like, but you don't. Hey, we 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 spent a long time on this. I have a question I'd like to ask. Sure. Um, so let's talk about the sanction scenario. Your front line in summary was if there are protests, anti-American sentiment doesn't matter. No, 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 no. there aren't. Right? So no, does no, anti-American sentiment protests. influence the com composition of the, of the government? It's possible I misspoke or there was like okay. mishearing or something, but my front line was there hasn't been anti-American protests since no, no, February. No. no, yeah, I heard you. What I'm saying is that even if there aren't protests, there are elections, and elections determine who constitutes the Iraqi government, and if it's pro-Iran, America sanctions. So anti-American sentiment makes the government pro-Iran, causes sanctions, triggers your impact. If, That's you, like if there's so right. much anti-American sentiment within Iraq, how come no one's protesting the United States, but everyone's protesting the like government who can't help them economically? First of all, they are. Second of all, they should have been. No, they're not. Them. No, I did. I said that there are no anti-American protests in the squo. If um, there is political no, that support, you probably see that the some sentiment doesn't exist. You don't, need, you don't need so much. Like, first of all, uh, um, um, 
uh, what was I going to say? Uh, protests are not the like litmus test for anti-American sentiment. You don't protests are the litmus all- test for most political revolutions. If you're going to say that there's going to be like a huge change in like Iraqi I, geopolitics, please can I finish. Then the second point is that you don't need so much anti-American sentiment to trigger protests. You only need enough anti-American sentiment for them to elect the hardliners into the government. Then once the hardliners get elected, regardless of whether or not protest happens, that is when you trigger the uh, turn well, that we are talking about. Right. right. Quick you question. Know, the protests, like the absence of protests, does not prove that hardliners in Iraq are not going to lose the election. That's ridiculous. That's time somewhat of a messy crossfire you know a lot of people talking over each other what are your takeaways from that if any yeah um no that's true a little bit of a messy crossfire um i think that one thing that it's important to do in grand cross is that if there's like a major concession of something that happens in summary and your approach that you think you're going to go for in the final focus is okay this is game over i think it's really important to hold that line as much as possible in grant And we sort of attempted to do that, right? Every time they try to, like, bring up these new criticisms of our warrant for, like, the anti-American sentiment stuff, the first thing we say is some iteration of, well, you didn't say that in summary, right? Or, like, what you actually said was just three words that it has no impact and there was no further work done on this question. Um, So I, I I think we do a decent job of holding the line. I also think one strategic thing I did in this crossfire um, and I would frequently do this in these sorts of situations, is that whenever, whenever you're trying to capitalize on a dropped argument, right, where you're closing the door and then implicating the argument itself and then saying, like, it's too late, they can't respond to it because they had their chance in, like, whatever speech and then they dropped it, it's important to not give them a chance to explain in Crossfire the foundations for an argument that's legitimate that they could make against it in Final Focus, right? And so you saw a couple of times when we were on that subject of the dropped turn, you saw me try and ask a question and change the subject, right? Because what I don't want to happen is I don't want this dude to make an argument that's like really good against our turn all of a sudden and that the judges buy um in grand crossfire right i was happy where we are on the flow and i want as little else said by them as possible and so yeah that was why i was kind of shutting down that conversation as much as possible yeah absolutely i mean the purpose is to set up final focus you don't want to give them anything they can use to run especially if you're already ahead uh, or if you, you feel that you're ahead you want to minimize variability that makes a lot of sense right okay let's hear the final okay Briefly on terrorism, they read the Bazi evidence that like, drone strikes cause anti-American sentiment. That's bad for them because remember, Zane tells you this turn's non-unique, non-unique because the drones happen anyway based on the concessions on their C2. You don't give them any offense on terrorism. That's in summary too. Go to their C3 where like, we're winning on the turn. On their offense specifically, the easiest place to vote is on the hard evidence. The hard, the hard evidence says that it's possible to have lethal retaliation, but as long as you have like some red line that shows when, where Iran and can and cannot cross, it lowers tensions. The reason that's important is because the evidence says historically this has worked with like killings in Soleimani, kill, the killing Soleimani, and also when like attacking Syria. That's really important because this means that even if you buy that the United States retaliates in like lethal fashion, it doesn't matter. There's no escalation that actually happens. But then secondly, they never really interact with the evidence that says like right now the most recent attack. They say like their evidence post date but it doesn't like our evidence is like pretty good in saying like the most recent retaliation the united states has done was on a malicious depot at night purposely to avoid casualties clearly the united states has no interest in escalating the cooper evidence is like really really clear on that there's no appetite for war at that point you extend our turn denver finds that right now iran needs iraq in order to escape uh sanctions in order to connect themselves to like the assad regime and hezbollah but middle finds that right now u.s influence in iraq counters iranian influence and prevents them from gaining total control but the jihad evidence finds that as soon as US, u.s troops withdraw the opposite happens and Iran gets control of Iran, or Iran gets control of Iraq. That's bad for two reasons. The first is sanctions. Jihad says that this triggers American hawks to treat Iraq as an enemy. It causes sanctions. That kills 227,000 people. They say two things. First, they say that like we're withdrawing on our own, own terms. But again, Omar frontlines this because Omar finds that Iraq will never kick us out. They fear sanctions. The second thing is like this anti-American support. But remember, Zane tells you like the main people, sh- the main way people sh- like show support is through protest. But there's literally no protest against America right now. Then the second impact is the Shia crescent. And what we tell you is that it, it allows for the Shia crescent, which the Wadley evidence says increases Sunni Shia tensions, which causes like more war. That their only responses are like Iran's expanding now. Middle says it's not true. And then secondly, the Denver evidence is better than their defensive realist evidence. Does that weigh in two? Ways. One, sanctions kill 227,000. It destabilizes Iraq. It also links into terrorism. But then, secondly, the conceded prereq or the conceded analysis that the Shia Crescent causes increase in tensions, causes increase in conflict, brings in the United States, triggers all of their links.
Shia Crescent makes at worst their argument not unique. I think the straight turn is still not really being dealt with as much as it could be. I think that given the emphasis of it on it in the prior speech, I think it's not enough just to say we cross applied the drone stuff that gets rid of it. I think you need to explain why that gets rid of it. Otherwise, it, the judge is sort of just left deciding on their own. And it seems like something that could be pretty substantially bad for the con if they're not dealing with it adequately. What yeah, yeah, no, that's that's definitely true. Um, I think it's pretty evident at this point that that is their biggest problem. Um, if I'm giving this speech, what happens when you have made a mistake in the round and you have given the other team some sort of offense that they inevitably have access to in the back half of the round is that what you can do is, that you, is you can weigh, right? You can make new weighing responses against essentially anything. You can make implication responses against essentially anything. But once you've actually conceded something, it doesn't really help you to try and squeak through like new substantive responses. And so I think that his decision to put the weighing at the absolute end of the speech um, makes him fall victim to, I think, a classic trap in public forum, which is just that, especially in a two-minute speech, whatever you put at the very end of the speech, you are going to under-warrant because you will run out of time. And that's essentially what happens here. Um, he doesn't have time to explain why it links into terror. And the other thing here is that you need more than just making the link bi-directional. And what I mean by that is, with our prereq, we say that terror triggers... Shia Crescent sanction scenario, blah, blah, blah. So that's making the link go in one direction, right? With with this attempted Wang, he's trying to make the link go in the other direction as well, which is that, okay, the Shia Crescent thing makes more terror. And so that might be true. Maybe the links, or rather, maybe the scenarios trigger each other. But then the question becomes, which one has a stronger link in the first place, right? And I think at this point, it's pretty clear that it's not the Shia Crescent scenario, because that's where our entire second contention offense is, and it's where, like, five, like, line-by-line line back and forths are happening. Um, and so that's sort of the dilemma that they're at at this point in the round. There's not really enough weighing work done um, to overcome the relative disparity in cleanliness of the two different areas of the flow. And judges always gravitate towards, or not always, but they tend to gravitate towards the cleaner places to vote. It makes sense. Cool. Let's see the final speech. The um, let's here. I need to arrange my papers for a second. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah, it's going to be their their case. Um, the Wang on the terror turns, then this the ban on our case. <clears throat> All right, is everyone ready? All right. Extend the turn. The Thrall and Gopner evidence, the extension Morgan makes in summary, not the Bozzi evidence, explains that U.S. regional military presence is the root cause of anti-American sentiment. Presence in the region makes civilians go against U.S., and it, 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 it is the reason why terror exists in the region. The evidence is fantastic. It says it is the root cause of regional terror. The only response they make, which because they totally like blew it in summary, is that, well, we conceded the Bozzi drone strikes thing, so drone strikes don't happen. Yeah, drone strikes are a cause of anti-American sentiment, but that doesn't mean that the turn that just says presence in general doesn't also trigger anti-American sentiment. At that point, we get 100% access to the Wang, which is conceded, and it ends the round. You don't even need to look at the other flow. The first is the strength of Link. There's a lot of conversation on the other flow. Morgan tells you the stronger Link vote there. He gives he, he shows you how to make the decision, and they drop it. The second prereq um, is, uh, is 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 that we are a pre, uh, is that we are a prerequisite to all the impact scenarios on their case. Regional war, instability. We say that when you proliferate terror across the entire region, new groups come in. Infighting happens. Refer this to their three-second blip saying they link it to terror in final focus because a it was later than morgan's weighing and b it literally was not warranted at all also their last piece of weighing they extended was over time ignore it on our case extend the link it's very clear how about 2020 explains uh with the link that uh that iran has recently expanded as mark said it needs to force us out this is an existential cho uh, choice iran is funding militias right now that are fighting with america and uh and she's going to explain that sucking america in we will have to we will have to estimate with nukes which kills millions of wipes out half the middle east they extend basically like two functional responses First, I guess, group the first two responses, they say, basically, it's just deterrence and no escalation now. Um, uh, uh, Abu Dhabi from April explains, yes, there is escalation now. He literally says, Iranian militias are fighting us right now. We post it and we're from April. And also, their evidence is about one strike. They drop that into 
in Night for Morgan too. But then, group both of the sanctions and also the Shia presence scenario. If Abaddon is true and Iran is fighting militias in Iraq, it non uniques both of these arguments. But then, um, on the first thing, extend anti American sentiment triggers sanctions. They just say that no protest. But if you uh, make a country anti America, that changes elections. And then on the Shia crescent, they drop Tisdal, which explains Iran is a defensive realist. Which means if we plot, they never expand. That's terminal defense on Shia crescent. It's cold conceded. All right. What do you think? Um, I mean, yeah, I think that uh, we capitalize on um, what we were able to do in summary decently in the speech. Um, I, I, I really like to, um, once a sort of mistake has been made, capitalize it on, uh, capitalize on it as much as you possibly can with a very healthy portion of ballot directive language, right? So note the, 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 the vernacular that I use at the top of the speech, which is there's this flow and it's super clear and it's the most important issue and you should ignore the entire other flow because it's really confusing. And I think the consistency there is also to our benefit because it's basically exactly what we said in summary. So then the only other thing that I have to do is I just have to clarify um, that his thing about like the drone strikes doesn't take us out of the turn because the turn is just about general presence, not just drone strikes. Um, and so once I've done those things, then I think we retain that path of the ballot. Um, and so we, we have two possible paths of the ballot. They have one possible path of the ballot. Um, and so that's the first path of the ballot for us that's possible. The second path of the ballot for us that's possible um, is by winning our contention, uh, too, uh, and thereby beating back their Shia Crescent type stuff. Um, you know, maybe we win this, maybe we don't. I don't know. It's uh, pretty messy. There's a lot of back and forth. Again, there's not really like enough language of preference. I think um, I could have done a little bit better of a job, like fully bringing home why the post date was so important. I think what I should have said is like, look, the fact that our Abado evidence says that there is literally uh, this uh, expansion and fighting happening right now means that the exact scenario they talk about where Iran is expanding into Iraq is literally occurring, terminally not uniquing it. And most importantly, it disproves the entire thesis of all of their arguments that America can deter. Um, I think just a simple, you know, 10 second blurb like that, that gives the full story for why the post date matters would have helped a lot and maybe would have made this flow a bit cleaner. Um, I don't really think I'm able to do that. I think I'm a little confusing here. Um, again, the whole elections protest, elections protest thing just continues to be an annoying wash to me. Um, uh, yeah, honestly, I think the trend of summaries continues after the speech, which is the straight turn flow is pretty clean. The other flow is pretty messy. And maybe you can wade through it if you want to. But, you know, you probably don't. Yeah, I think the thing to think about with the straight turn flow is two things. One is judge instruction explaining what's going on, which I think you do a good job of. And then second is the more meaty, here's why our argument outweighs, which I think this final focus does not do as good of a job of. There's the strength of link argument, but I think there just needs to be more of a solid, this outweighs the other offense on a substantive level. Like, here is some impact calculus for why anti-American sentiment is of greater importance than this other stuff going on. And I also think there could just be more of a more judge instruction actually surrounding this whole drone strike kick out where you just explain more fundamentally they only said one word on this in final focus they just asserted that drone strikes take this out uh but they didn't give an explanation so i don't even really need to answer the argument because it's not a complete argument so i think those things could have been handled differently but i think all in all it's a solid final focus what are your thoughts on the debate as a whole some main takeaways for students watching this yeah um so I think that's all super fair. Um, a few things on the debate as a whole. The first thing is that similar to our last debate uh, that, that we analyzed, I don't know if people will see that, um, but one thing that this debate uh, sort of exemplifies the importance of is the need to be able to go for non-case positions if you have to and if the opportunity arises, which it won't always arise, right? A lot of the time, if you read a straight turn, the team will deal with it and your case will be cleaner and then you don't want to go for it, right? But um, the, the, the most important, one of the most important things that good PF teams are able to do is that they don't decide what they're going for before the round begins. Many teams do this, right? Many teams have two contentions and then they always go for the second contention, come hell or high water. And if you do that, you leave so much on the table. Um, because, say, someone makes a huge mistake, and you can create a clean path to the ballot that escapes a super muddy debate, 
um, maybe you never win that round when you could have if you had the uh, if 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 you had the ability to make that different strategic decision earlier in the round. The second thing is that I agree overall um, with the idea that the <clears throat> impact calc in this debate was not what it could have been. Um, you know, granted, you don't want to make any new impact calc in second final focus, but pre second final focus, I think there's a lot to be desired on the impact calc. And I also think that Morgan and I had something that we could have easily taken advantage of, which is we did have a pretty darn smart impact scenario, which is that just conventional war triggers a nuclear holocaust over the Middle East and kills millions of people because you bomb the uh, nuclear reactor sites, which creates like a Chernobyl-type meltdown. Um, and you can weigh that on magnitude. You can analyze that in a lot more ways than we were able to do. Um, when you have a messy round on the line by line, you have to win the line by line, but you also have to create non-messy ways to step back um, and clarify things. And I think impact calc wise, both teams could have done a lot better of a job on that. Um, the third thing I would say is I think this, 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 uh, debate highlights the importance of evidence debate, right? We were able to really rely on the whole like post state thing a lot. Um, but honestly it would have been better if we had been able to maybe point to another element of our author, maybe the credentials, uh, maybe a statistic, maybe something, or maybe we would be, do 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 a better job of explaining um, the importance of the post state than we did. Because when you have a confusing, messy line by line, language of preference becomes really important, right? When the when one team says yes and you say no, and that just goes back and forth for three speeches, and nobody is able to engage and take the time to do like a deeper dive into the warranting behind all of the arguments. What you need is an independent reason to prefer your yes to their no. Um, and so, yeah, that was one major theme that kept coming up for me as I was listening to these speeches. What do you think, Ravi? Yeah, I think it's all very thorough, and I agree with all of it. One thing I would add is that there is, I think, the importance of really just going for the low-hanging fruit. When a straight turn is dropped, it makes sense to really make that your primary out. Don't overcomplicate things. Collapse down. You only need to win the debate once. And that's sufficient for you to win if you play your cards right. And I think that's the thing that the pro does effectively in terms of really just making the debate about that. And I think the, the flip side of that, of course, is just be careful. Don't miss straight turns. Those are things that can be determinative for a debate. So you want to make sure that you're really dotting your I's and crossing your T's, so to speak, and not missing arguments. But yeah, all in all, I thought it was a good debate, and I'm glad we got to analyze it. Any last words you want to say before we close out? No, definitely. Um, those are good thoughts. And yeah, nothing else to add except for if you want to see more content like this, head over to debatedrills.com, look at the public forum section under services, and check out the Academy. Lots of great stuff that we're going to be putting out there. And uh, Rafi himself will be um, putting out some excellent content. And yeah, I'm super excited for what's to come. Awesome. Well, thanks for analyzing the debate and hope everyone got something out of this. Bye, y'all.